on your, on your tables. It will have uh, the details of myself and Clint Spencer. Shoot us an email via that Adelaide at smartseeds.org and we'll take it from there um, and, and welcome you into the program. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So just to be clear, it's that document yep. which is on everybody's tables, right? Yep. And what do you want us to do? You want us to fill in? To email us via the contact on there. Yep. Okay. If you want to attend. Yeah, if you want to be involved. And when's the first? December 5th, we're doing a challenge workshop with the senior leaders. So those in this room that would like to be involved. And then we kick off with your emerging leaders next year. Okay. And that December 5th thing, I believe, is a breakfast? That's right. Breakfast. Yep. So if you'd like to be involved. at what time, roughly? Well, uh, it starts at 7.30, and it's at the uh, Samurai building, I believe. It's, it's Samurai. Yeah, Samurai. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So... Final speaker for today, um, and I'm pleased to say again, somebody from outside of South Australia who's travelled here from uh, this time beautiful Bellingen on the New South Wales coast. Originally born and bred in Melbourne, but travelled with his father's work at Kodak, and travelled not only with the work with the family to Japan and other destinations before coming back to study at university in New South Wales. Jason Airy earned his Bachelor of Science in Earth Science and Oceanography from the University of New South Wales and his Masters in Marine Geochemistry from the University of New South Wales. Jason is married with two children. He's a bit of a, an adventure sports person, including ultra deep diving, mountain climbing. He was a state champion in sailing and powerboat driving, among other things. He's passionate about the environment and sustainable development, which has led him to create his company, OEMG Global. The company was created in 2009 has a small number of employees and subcontractors to deliver his work all around the world. Jason also chairs the NGO Oz Green. Jason's talk today will be about the innovative and unique technology he has developed to create integrated digital ground models for infrastructure design and asset management. Today's talk is focused on his work with the US Army Corps of Engineers. Please welcome Jason Erie to the stand. So, I know a bit about innovation. Um, I sit at the bleeding edge of it. Um, I can tell you that uh, enough people throw around words like, uh, particularly politicians throw around words like innovation, entrepreneur, law enforcement, fiscal responsibility, and election time. And, and, and unfortunately, those words are quite unaccountable and often cheaper than those words. Because innovation is innovation is hard. Sorry, about it. Um, innovation is painful, and breaking through barriers um, is very, very difficult. There's very few innovation programs that I've seen that are actually interesting. And, and Jim's one that I saw. You know, I was saying to someone earlier that if, I, I reckon if Jim can get half of what he wants done, it'll be a damn good start. So I wish you guys best of luck and, uh, and, and I hope a lot of comes out of that because I know how hard innovation is. Um, look, I, I suppose I've got to start. I mean, I, I spent um, 20 years, you know, I've been in this career almost 30 years and I, I spent 10 years in the Gulf over 2000, around 2000 to 2008 or so. Um, and you don't kind of, you're not in that kind of part of the world without seeing some really cool defence stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I, I had to do this survey once in this uh, port, you know, Marne, and it was a tiny little fishing port. And, uh, and I was there in my little putt putt boat going up and down doing the survey lines because they wanted to expand the port. And then uh, and this American attack boat came in. You know, there was, it was it's basically a souped up scarab kind of boat with uh, 10 heavy machine guns hanging off the back. And, uh, and, and I, I, I think as close as I can understand, something akin to the special boat forces um, recruiting it. Um, you know, silent predator kind of guys. But anyway, so this boat came in, and then an Amani Coast Guard boat came in. 
uh, full to the brim with Iranian refugees. And then behind that, another American attack boat, same one, 10, 10 heavy machine guns on the back. Anyway, so they, they came in and, and I didn't pay much attention. I, I finished my lines and then uh, when I had to get my lunch, I noticed that they'd taken up the whole wall. So um, these, uh, these attack boats were the lowest boats. So I just pulled up to it and I said to my crew in Arabic, you know, tie up the lines. And of course, um, of course, this uh, guy with a big machine gun sort of looks down at me and says, what are you doing? And I said, mate, you, you've taken up the whole wharf. I'm loading through. And so he goes, oh, okay. And I said, here, take this. And I started loading all my equipment under his boat. <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, I had way better GPS gear on, on my boat than I did on his. And, you know, I'm loading it all through. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I, I have hours of stories, but I know I'm the only thing in the way of you and your drinks, so I'll get on with <laughs> <laughs> um, right. yeah. So, uh, look, ground modelling. Um, risk ground modelling. We need to equate ground modelling with risk management. Um, and we need to change the way it's done currently. Um, it was recently said we need to rebalance risk. We need, um, we need the allocation of upfront risk between the, the governments and private sector to be, uh, is currently asymmetrical and it's becoming unsustainable. Um, infrastructure, industry, the big risks um, placed on, on the livelihoods of contractors is uh, workplace relations and um, geotechnical. And I would suggest geotechnical is the bigger of those two. None of these risks, it goes on to say, belong with the contractor. And they're absolutely true. None of the risks belongs to the contractor. They don't own them, they can't control them, and it's very, very difficult to price them at the construction phase. This was said by Steve McCann of uh, Lendlease. We've all seen Lendlease in the paper. <coughs> but it, this was said in 2015, and precisely nothing has happened on this front since 2015. And yesterday, we're all aware that Lendlease uh, announced a 600 million write down on their engineering business, and 2.2 billion was wiped off their share price. So let's look at what we might be able to do about that. The base of our technology is called Acares. Um, it's uh, a digital sub-bottom sub profiling system. It works on land and marine. Um, marine's way cooler, so I talk about marine a lot. Um, um, we can get accurate sub-bottom data, and we can define heights to geology, and we can define the quality of the geology, the sub-meter level, and the sub-25 centimeter level in the vertical. Uh, some meter in the horizontal and sub 25 meter in the vertical. Um, we can create point clouds. Essentially, it's a fully digital system. From acquisition, our digital conversion occurs at acquisition. Um, everything from processing all the way to presentation to the client is 100% digital. And you'll see the outcomes of this in a minute. But it's a really cool piece of tech, and it it's the ble it's beyond the bleeding edge of what anyone else is doing in ground modeling. Nobody is close to to anything like this globally. Globally, yeah. So we've won a couple of awards about this, and anyone that's got kids knows that you can't do anything in your house without a kid being involved. So if you can probably all spot where's Wally there. Um, we won the 2018 Working with Nature Award from Piang, which is a really difficult award. To, it's a really competitive award out of Brussels from the Water Board, World, World Authority for Waterborne Transport. Um, we won that in 2018, in this year. We won the Most Innovative Consulting Engineers from EA. Um, we just, the other day I won the, the 2018 Regional Innovation Award from the Business Chamber and, uh, and in 2015 I won the State Innovation Award. I think I've got to go down next week to see if I win the state one again, but we'll see. So why, why are we looking at this and why is Lendlease so now concerned about this is, is because 20 to 50% of projects in Australia suffer cost and time overruns due to geotechnical conditions. Right? Think about that, 20 to 50% of projects. You know that 20 to 50% of projects are gonna run over. So I can guarantee you 100% of projects are overpriced and overspec to account for that. 
And indeed, if we look at um, if we look at some outside <laughs> data from the US, this is from um, the construction uh, industry um, institute. <laughs> This is from the this is, this is something from John, the Construction uh, Institute uh, in uh, Austin, Texas. They did a study of near on a thousand projects around the world and found that 95% of them fell outside of their objectives. Okay, be it cost over cost underruns or cost overruns. Um, another study by McKenzie's, is slightly smaller, um, found that 98% missed their objectives. Okay, so we have a serious problem with the way projects are scoped, not only in Australia, but also in the world. And strategic ground modelling, or ground modelling of the asset, creating a digital twin of your asset, which is not the construction alignment. Your asset is your whole concession, be it a port, um, uh, you know, a whole road corridor. That's your asset. Survey your asset and then decide what is going to fit in there rather than telling you know, a contractor that you must build that bridge there. If we can change what we're doing, it's going to be, uh, have quite a profound impact. As I said at the start, we need to start thinking of um, risk in more creative ways. So if we look at the way um, uh, a construction project is currently undertaken. You got your definition, planning, execution, uh, monitoring, and um, and closure phases. Okay, so <coughs> we have many downside risks associated with that: poor project planning, um, unfavorable contract conditions, high risk margins, a whole lot of downside risks. But associated with all those downside risks are its upside companion. And we really have to think, have we created the circumstance in which we can start to capture those upside risks for the project owner? You can see that as your, as your, as your project moves towards your um, execution phase and, and, and generally your ground modelling is undertaken at your execution phase, you've got no upside risk left. It's all been converted into the downside risk. And the only way you're going to capture that downside risk is by going to court. Or sorry, the only way you're going to mitigate that downside risk is in court. But also, and more importantly, the value of any upside risk is, is lost by the time you get to um, project execution. All of that upside risk is incredibly valuable, not just at um, inception phase, but prior to that at, project, uh, at, at asset management phase. If we can start to do these ground models at the asset management phase, the value or the strategic value of those decisions is enormous. Should we even build a bridge? Should we be doing a tunnel? Can we actually build a key wall there? Is, uh, is that a road alignment going to work? Should we abandon that channel and build a new one? Courageous decisions, but decisions that are capable of being made if you have the ground modelling data. Now, and I kid you not here, this is a tier one consultant's uh, ground model delivered to a client. And you know, points for colouring in in crayon. Late, late stage opportunities. So, this data here is grabbed from the Port of Eden data. Um, and, and the Port of Eden, the Port of Eden um, works, we, we did all of the ground modeling works for that and, and a lot of the awards we got were based on this data. So I want to have a little look at this. So initially we started off with 40 year old boreholes that were more or less on the construction alignment, within 30 metres of the construction alignment. I think we were up to 40 metres off. And you can see that there's no rock at all anywhere near the construction alignment. Um, they did some traditional geophysics, um, 1D kind of geophysics, uh, and again, there's an additional layer in there, or is there? You can't really tell because all you're looking at is depth to layer information, you're not looking at quality information associated with that layer, and the quality is where your money is. 
So then we came along and said, mate, you're in a world of hurt. Um, that, that red stuff is probably a rock. So it was fortunate that we had a, uh, a really good client. And, and it's worthwhile noting that we can't tender on any of these jobs. Okay? Our technology sits outside the normal tender process. So, you know, I, I know you have to say yes to the client all the time, and it's great to be able to say yes, but sometimes you have to say no. No, it's not the best technology. No, we don't think this is going to work. So, so I went up to the client during the tendering phase, and I, I happened to know him from a, so, uh, outside, and I said, mate, let's, let's do this work. And he agreed. And he carved out some budget and, and gave us a sole select contract. And it's quite fortunate for him because sitting in that, or buried in that, that geological data, was a whole lot of rock that nobody knew about. And not only was it rock, it was vertically featured rock. So you, you end up with, um, so you end up with the red as rock. And then if you move right, you've got not rock and then rock again. And then on the left, you've got a whole lot of not rock. Um, we, it's, it's important to note that we can't tell you what we're looking at, but we can tell you that there's a substantial difference going laterally across that site, and you need to test that. Right, when, I, when I go up to um, a client and, they've, uh, and deliver my data to the client, I say to my client, you have to assume I'm wrong. Now let's figure out a way to prove that I'm right. So. The client worked with us, and we worked with uh, Wally Parsons was a consultant on this one. We worked with the, the client, Wally Parsons, and we worked out a um, borehole campaign to, first of all, prove that the data was right. We didn't care about the alignment. We convinced the client not to care about the alignment. We, we convinced the client to care about um, testing the data first and foremost. So we assigned a number of boreholes to the different um, um, resistivity or geophysical zones that we found there. And sure enough, the boreholes came out sort of moving from left to right, not rock, not rock, rock, not rock, rock, rock. Across the whole site, across 15 boreholes that we did, we had a cumulative vertical error of less than a metre. So we were bloody close. And, uh, and uh, there were quite a number of significant outcomes from this project, which we'll talk about in a minute. But let's, let's think about the asset. So the asset is the entire port region. It's not just that alignment. So given that we suddenly found out a whole lot of hurt that the client was going to expect if they tried it to build in a traditional manner, when, we, when I first went up to the client, I pointed out that it's going to cost me the same amount of money to do the alignment because we all know that the, the cost is in the mobilisation for any kind of job. But I pointed out to the client, it's going to cost him the same to do the alignment as it will for me to do the whole port. So we did the whole port. And this is the world's first digital twin of a port. So there's the entire port. This represents roughly one and a half million data points across the entire port binned in 25 centimetre bins in the vertical and 5.5 metre bins in the horizontal. So you, there's a few few probably uh, bad guys um, around here, Navisworks people, that can see where we're going with this and what we're going to end up with. We can now stick anything, any proposed building, we can now stick in this digital twin and test it and see how it's going to work. We know exactly the sort of pile toes that we're going to have. Um, we know if the client, you know, if, 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 if the contractor's got a, a, a pension to, to, to pile into rocks or not rocks, we can tailor everything to that. So integrated digital ground models. Um, our objectives in creating them is, or, or for this particular job, was to survey the whole port as one package. Um, we targeted boreholes we disregarded any idea of what they thought they wanted to put in the port. And we said, first and foremost, test the model. And as soon as we got confidence of the model across the whole port, then we can start to make some pretty good strategic decisions about um, what is suited to that port. Um, 
And then we were able to archive all that digital data. It's simply, uh, I mean, we work in binaries, but it's, it's exportable to an XYZ quality grid. Um, and that goes anywhere. Point clouds, um, um, contour surfaces, whatever you want to do with it. Um, and so we accurately map the, the changing geologies across the whole port. The cost benefits specifically from this job is it, it, it was a fairly, it costs about $100,000 to acquire all that data. Um, but at the end of the day, we knocked $5 million off um, the dredge costs that were estimated to be $25 million. Um, so we saved roughly 20% of the project budget. Um, we demonstrated to the, the dredge contractors that they didn't need to import a rock dredger from Europe. So all of a sudden the tier two dredgers in Australia could then go to work were brought into play and they used a backhoe instead of a rock cutter. Um, and during construction, the dredging company said, you know what, if we actually alter the, the alignment by three degrees, you're gonna get uh, an extra 25 meter of hull length on that jetty, which is, is the next class of cruise ship. Uh, and they did it for free. Um, so they got larger ships, um, they got larger wave attenuators. The waiver, interestingly, um, you know, it was a 25 million dredge campaign, but we heard on the side that they'd budgeted an extra 25 mil for the overruns. Um, and because we demonstrated very early on that we were going to keep to the um, project budget, um, all the contracts in place were collaborative. There were no sort of combative contracts. But because we demonstrated quite early on that we were going to keep to the budget, um, the remaining budget was released for phase two. So um, the community um, assets, the wave attenuators for the recreational boats and everything, the, the money that was set aside for overruns was released to phase two and the community got their wave attenuators much earlier on. Um, and there was no impact to the receiving environment. As, as a precaution, the mussel farmers were paid to um, go away um, during the dredging, but because it ended up being um, uh, bucket dredging, um, they were able to keep the farming during the dredging because it's very low impact version of dredging. So they were quite happy on two accounts. So context is everything. We changed that survey of the alignment area into a digital twin of the whole port for the same cost. Yeah, yeah you guys are ready to talk to me now, right? <laughs> um, so should we think differently? Um, I lifted this slide from um, uh, LinkedIn yesterday. Um, this is from the British Geological Survey who are acting under the auspices of the, of, of the British government. Um, they're currently on, the, on a digital drive for geospatial data. Uh, on a very basic estimate, they reckon that tomorrow, decent geospatial data will save the, the, the Crown 4.6 billion pounds. That's, and that's just on construction risk. Let's move it to strategic, and how much do you think that's going to uh, inflate to? Um, supports better planning, and at the moment, they're sitting there grappling on how to make a digital framework. It's already been done. We've been doing it for 10 years. So what if we said unforeseen geology is not bad luck? but it's a consequence of systemic failures in risk management. If we start to say that, then we can ask some different questions. We can say, what is the structure most suited to the site objectives, rather than saying, um, here's a bridge, go build it there. If we do that, the what feeds into the how, because all of that data is proved and we can move it into the how phase. Um, but the how stands alone. If we're only surveying for that, how do I build this? There's no opportunity in that. We all know that um, if you've got unforeseen geological conditions, you're just going to pour a bit of concrete until it's fixed. So let's think bigger. Here's roughly 60-70% of the entirety of Geelong Port surveyed with this technology. 550 line kilometres of data 355,000 individual shot points comprising 14.2 million data points. Um, and this was done in nine days. And it was processed in another nine days. This is now sitting in Geelong Port's strategic asset management.
Again, Dara gas, gas development in Papua New Guinea. Um, they went along there first and they made a whole lot of traditional uh, survey techniques. Um, and up that top left hand corner there, you can see the sheets. I mean, are you going to be using two dimensional sheets like that and be able to make conscious decisions on, on how that's going to affect it? Or are you going to look at that, um, that, that horizontal outlay there? Um, that outlay there, uh, it's a bit hard with no pointers, but uh, down the bottom right there, the proposed channel pass. And that represents $150 million of unaccounted for risk because they put their channel through um, unforeseen rock. But if you look to it, just to the right, there's a pre-carved pre paleo channel that's already at depth. All they've got to do is knock the sand off. Up the top, there's a pre-made entrance into the harbour, again as a paleo channel that nobody detected. Um, and oddly enough, at the mouth of the Fly River, nobody found construction quality sand. It's the mouth of the Fly River. There's plenty of sand there. Again, in nine days, we found 220 cubic million uh, feet of sand. So integrated digital ground models, let's put everything together in a digital space. Okay? We'll export to CAD for you. We'll put everything in Navisworks. We'll 3D print it. We'll put it in augmented reality and virtual reality. It's digital. It can do anything you want. We've got the proven technology now to map huge areas very, very quickly um, for, for vertical accuracy and quality accuracy. Um, let's forget doing ground modeling on a piecemeal approach. If you're thinking about ground modeling for a piece of infrastructure, you're well behind the curve. Is that even the right spot to be putting that infrastructure? Right? There's plenty of really good digital techniques out there for, for broad scale mapping. And then there's my technique for when you're more narrowed down. Let's combine this in a digital space and start making sensible decisions. And according to uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers, we keep on working for them because according to them, we're finally done with the guesswork. And it's the big projects as well. Um, Metro across Sydney Harbour. That red dashed line there is what they think the rock is based on the reflection surveys, the reflection geophysics. And the black line is the tunnel alignment. So you can see where those arrows are. The tunnel is supposed to be roughly 15 metres into the rock. Yeah, but unfortunately the reflection didn't work. Mm. And it turns out that the tunnel alignment is actually going through soft sediment. And when you're um, 20 metres into the, in, into the subsurface, which is another 20 metres under the surface, water surface, that's a huge amount of hydrostatic pressure and water ingress that you've got to deal with. This stopped tendering. They changed their entire process based on this data. They're now, instead of coming in from the McMahon's Point side, they're coming in from the Barangaroo side. So uncertainty is a systemic failure to understand and account for the natural variation within a layer, if you're talking geotechnics. Current methodologies are not working. They're analog and they're old. So let's talk about some of the work that we're doing for the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, New York Harbor. Um, so I talk about the accuracy of our data. Um, this comes out in the Geelong port stuff as well. Um, but in, in, uh, in, in New York Harbour here, they, they had an old, um, the old channel was dredged by blast dredging. So you basically drill a small hole and you pack it with dynamite and you blow out the rock. Um, it's quite an expensive, laborious, slow way to do things, but in some cases it's the only way to do it. Um, and you always go deeper than your dredge limit because you, you can't end up, like it, it's very, very painful if you've suddenly found you haven't blasted deep enough. So the question from US Army Corps of Engineers is, is how deep has the fracturing gone? And so with our technology, you can see the blue layer on top of the red there. The blue layer represents highly fractured rock and the red layer is competent rock. So we we're actually able to tell them how deep the, the fracturing went from the previous drill of last campaign. And based on this data, they were able to use a bucket dredger instead of a rock dredger or more drilling blasting. 
it's pretty much the only tech in the world that can get this kind of resolution. Well, it is the only tech in the world that can get that kind of resolution. Um, phase two, um, one of the outcomes of drill and blast dredging is you often get um, slabbing at the top if you don't do it correctly. Um, the black stuff uh, over the orange stuff represents slabs over um, uh, existing geology. So it was very important for them to know that because slabs can be notoriously difficult to remove depending on the size. Um, and so they were able to work with the contractors to create collaborative, uh, again, collaborative <coughs> contracting to try and get these slabs out of the way. Um, so I, 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 I mentioned that I won quite a few awards. Well, yeah, unfortunately when you have children, they like to always show you up. So my daughter insisted I take a photo of her stuff. <laughs> Yeah, um, St. John's River, um, St. John's River, Florida, if anyone's been to Florida, they know there's huge problems with fresh water over salt water, um, and, and, and you really have to manage your fresh water in Florida because, you know, it's quite flat. So, um, one of the things about our aquarism method is that we can actually tell the difference between fresh and salt water um, uh, aquifers, and we can also actually tell the difference between various types of freshwater aquifers, which is kind of interesting. Um, also, as on a little aside, if anyone's dealing with acid sulfates, we can actually tell the difference between potential and activated acid sulfates and the volume of the material you need to move. Um, but, um, so here you can see there's fresh water uh, underneath and there's some infiltration into the fresh water. So I don't have a laser or anything like that. Maybe I've got, no, I have a, I'll see that. Um, the red, red is basically fresh water, high resistivity stuff because fresh water is not as good at transmitting current. And the, um, the lower resistivity stuff is the salt water uh, comparison. Um, so we're actually showing here as well ingress into the freshwater aquifers and where they really need to be really careful not to uh, promote any further ingress into that aquifer. Um, Miami Harbour. Um, what? What? Do they have to prevent the ingress of the salt? Oh, because you don't want to get too much salt into your fresh water because fresh water is quite important for drinking and watering stuff. Um, um, look, one of the real benefits of us, particularly in the marine environment, is we're shooting at every 900 milliseconds. So basically every one metre we're doing a bore, the equivalent of a borehole um, digitally. Um, so we can pick up really fine floaters and rock heads and things like that. Um, halfway through their dredging um, of Miami Harbour, they realised that there was um, a whole lot of uh, floaters and rock heads. Um, so they called us in to go and resurvey everything and we went and found all the floaters and then uh, the US Army Corps was able to, um, of engineers, sorry, was able to go and work with the contractors um, to renegotiate the removal of those rock heads. 